What is a star? The, a star is definitely not what we're being told it is in school. A, a giant ball of gas on fire out in the middle of space. It has not been scientifically proven. <laughs> it's scientific theory. When I was assigned to the research vessel, there were expeditions to the sun to where probes were shot into the sun. And they would shoot these probes into sunspots. Well, the first thing would be, how do you get a probe into the sun without it burning up? Energy fields around. Oh, OK. Yeah, the probes. So a very high intensity energy field that shields it from being burned up. Right. And it also collapsed from the gravitational. Gravi mm -hmm. Right. What was seen from the telemetry that came back from these probes was amazing. The sun is electric. The people that are talking about the electric plasmic model of the universe, they're correct. And But that model usually excludes torsion fields. Yes, it does. They, there's some stuff that needs to be, some information that needs to be married. Right. But, uh, but the, the, there's, obviously, torsion fields are involved in, the, in not only the stars, the planets, the galaxy. And as I said before, I was shown that our entire universe is a giant torsion field. Scientific statistics says there's a one in eight chance every decade for a super solar storm. So we're long overdue. The last kill shot solar storm we had was 1921. That's, that's 95 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the one before that was only 60 years earlier, the Great Carrington event. So both of those happened before we had the grid uh, Achilles heel. The, you know, we didn't have a big grid in those days. Now we have these giant transformers that are going to blow in a super solar storm. And they take one to three years to replace them. It could be a destruction of our power grid that could literally throw us back into medieval level technology. When South Africa lost 14 transformers in 2003, I believe it was, it took them a full year to replace those 14. Now we're not talking about 14, we're talking about 350 or more in the United States alone, a couple thousand in the world. That's 20 years of manufacturing capacity if the world's working well, and it won't be, to replace all those transformers. So you're talking a single storm in a day or two, what it would take 20 years working full time to replace. So we're talking a really serious situation where it'll be months before things are even limping along. And in that time, a lot of people will starve and a whole bunch of nuclear power plants are gonna melt down and there's gonna be chaos in the streets for a very long time. You know, my biggest concerns are the electromagnetic pulse threat. You got the solar flares, all that stuff is gonna happen at some point. An electromagnetic pulse is caused by a high altitude nuclear blast or a solar flare coming through our atmosphere. When an EMP hits, it can take out the electrical grid for an extended period of time. So why did they pick a sunspot and not some other place? Well, the telemetry from the inside of our star, Sol. SOL is what they call it? That's what it's referred to. Right. There was a core that was fairly small and they could tell it was made up of uh, mag magnesium, sodium, I can't remember all the elements. And the outer- Mostly metallic? Yeah. Wow. And then the outer shell was made up of similar materials, but it was like an anode and cathode. Okay. So, it was a an electrical, almost almost like a light bulb, and the sun spots were going into the center of the sun, like vortex filaments, streaming into the center of the 
densest part in the middle of the star. Tiny, thin little tornado spirals and crisscrossing each other, uh, spinning around, crisscrossing each other, and going and meeting down to the to the small center. War, pandemic, economic turmoil, natural disaster, terror attack, terror attack, terror attack, terror attack, false flag or real. In our modern times, these are all very real reasons to prepare for times of crisis. This list, however, is excluding the worst case scenario, which is also the most likely to occur. EMP or an electromagnetic pulse. Whether such a disaster is caused by a terror attack or nature, the results will be unimaginable. No lights, no appliances, your cell phone will not work, and your car isn't going to start. Worst yet, the power will not be turned back on for at least an entire year. The spread of the damage will cover almost the entire Western continent. That's no lights, no heat, no refrigeration, and no plumbing. Society will ultimately break down. How can you and your family survive such a disaster? In the next few moments, we will explore these questions. We asked survival experts Joel Skousen, Matthew Stein, and James Wesley Rawls to join us and briefly explain the most important things every American must know to stay alive during the most unthinkable of times. What will it look like? Well, I think for most people, uh, it'll simply be a matter of a, uh, a blackout and then they'll go to check their radios and find that um, nearly all of the radio stations are off of the air. All media, all electronics uh, and power from the grid will go down. You won't have any electricity anywhere and you'll turn on your television, you won't see anything, you won't hear anything on the radio. And that's, uh, so it will be very clear that this is a widespread electrical outage. It'll, it'll all go down at once. You can kind of figure on people being fairly peaceable for a day or two, and, and then the looting will happen and everything will be gone from the shelves after the loosening gets started. Like within a day, it'll probably be pretty much wiped clean. But you can, you can pretty much expect chaos to be running in the streets. Well, it does make sense because a lot of times when we're looking at sunspots, we see actual rings burst out of the sun, tubes of energy. It's called a solar prominence, and you have this ring come out. And so you're saying that that's not just on the surface, that those go way down right to the core. Right to the core. Wow. And these are also, at times, depending on the sun's behavior, stargates that are utilized by different extraterrestrial groups hmm. to go in and out of our solar system. And this was, there was a wide open empty area inside the sun. Now there is a very large area outside, on the outside of the area I've described, that is molten and on fire. And they found out that it was hotter, it's hotter on the outside of the sun and cooler on the inside. The sun or soul is being fed by way, some sort of waves that are hitting it. And that is what is causing the outside to be so active. And also it is being fed through what I described as the, the cosmic web. Each of each sun each star is connected to every other star through this cosmic web. Hmm. And each one is connected through a filament, electromagnetic filament that we were describing that connects each star. So things can happen in one solar system to one star, and there can be feedback through the system, this network, that can affect the, our solar system. The immediate effects 
uh, are going to be profound. That's the area where you're going to have uh, cars that won't start, for example, if they have electronic ignition systems. It is sufficient to understand that with long power lines lacing the country, these absorb this electromagnetic energy as, as if they're great big antennas, and they send huge power uh, surges down the power lines, which ends up frying any equipment that is plugged into the electrical uh, power system. And this surge occurs in one to two nanoseconds, which means lightning protection, uh, those types of clamping shunt type protectors will not work in an EMP. It's much faster than that, and the surge will get through. So special equipment is needed to protect against EMP. Anything connected to the power grid, uh, the internet itself will be gone, and most radio broadcasts will be out. And of course, then the whole cascade of events will take place because we're going to be without power and without automatic ordering systems, uh, without a lot of uh, controls over uh, key infrastructure, which depend on the internet, the power grid, and the phone system. You have to have your three Bs together, your beans, your bullets, your Band-Aids, meaning that you have to have food stored up, you have to have uh, first aid, uh, there's going to be no pharmacies you can go to, you can't call doctors, you have to have good, a good survival library put together, and then the protection to know that there's going to be, uh, there's a heavily armed populace in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who won't be prepared. And so you need to be prepared to defend yourselves and you need to have strategic partners. By that, I mean that no one uh, can be awake 24 seven, you know, you, and you're much stronger in number. So once we see this flash occur, you're saying that positive beings of some kind come in and make sure that nobody can mess with the process. Right. What does that actually look like for the people? How do they trust what's going on? How do they know what this is? For the most part, they don't know that there's a guardian race that's come in to oversee their process. Oh. Yeah, they're oblivious to it. it there will be people in their society that will know about it, kind of like Micah knew what was going on. But for the most part, they don't know. They're focused on their planet, on their healing, and making it through this process. Did Micah's solar system also have these sphere assets come in to mm -hmm. help transition it? They went through the exact same thing that we're going through. This ascension is a consciousness shift. And when our consciousness goes through this shift, we see everything from a completely different way. All of our problems, we see from different angles, we connect with each other in a different way because we start to understand oneness, how we are, we are all one and how we can communicate easier when you understand the, the full concept of oneness. And then we begin to kind of pull together and, and assist each other and work with the non-terrestrials. So do you think the U.S. government, do they need to do more to protect uh, you know, the power grid and in our infrastructure? Have they done enough? No, they haven't done enough. They've protected military infrastructure. Of course. But they really need high capacity, very strong surge protectors, the EMP uh, less than one nanosecond surge protectors on the entire grid, and they don't have that. The investment required to upgrade the infrastructure of our power grids, for example, and the phone system would, yes, be in the uh, in the the range of in the billions of dollars to do, but compared to what we spend every year on welfare, it would be a drop in the bucket. No, it's probably less than the banker bailouts. Oh, far less, Yeah, far less. It's important to also have a solar battery charger. Even if you can't afford a whole house system, you would at least have a small five or 10 watt panel and a battery charging tray so that you can uh, recharge all your crucial electronics. And that would be things like flashlights, your portable radios, your night vision equipment, and your push-to-talk radio gear for retreat security, you want, you're going to have to be able to communicate with your neighbors. So you want to have some, some walkie-talkies. The first line of defense is to put on a what is called a whole house shunt protector. And there are a few companies that do put out this equipment. Uh, Transtector, for example, is a military contractor which will sell to the public. Go off-grid. 
if you have the the wherewithal to uh, set up your home for photovoltaic power, go ahead and do so. But make sure that it is not a grid-tied system. It needs to be a standalone system. Well, I'd say the absolute most important thing is to be planning for the grid being down for a really long, long period of time. That you, you just know the government's not planning ahead. They're not going to watch out for you. All of your spare electronics should be stored in galvanized steel trash cans with a tight-fitting lid. All you need to do is bundle them up in uh, something to insulate them from the can itself. Uh, just plastic wrap works fine. And seal the lid of that can. You do not need to ground the, the, the can to an earth ground. In fact, it's actually worse in the case of EMP to ground it because you're making an unintentional antenna by doing so. This um, hyperdimensional mathematics model that was handed down to us that we use to calculate portal travel with every star and planet and galaxy having a relationship with each other. You have to be able to calculate these things because you can have weird little hiccups that can cause weird things like what you were talking about in that experiment. It unifies basically all of these different scientific principles that um, our mainstream science has problems with. And uh, until our mainstream science drops their theory and begins to embrace the fact that the universe is a plasmic electric universe hmm. and a torsion universe, both are true. These are the sciences that the secret space program bases their technology off of. They're not going to progress any further than we are now using this 18th and early 19th century technology. When they sent these probes through the sun, did the probe go somewhere else, or was it just that they mapped the interior out like that? It mapped the interior out, sent back telemetry until it succumbed to the forces inside the sun. It, the, it, it was basically a little suicide mission for this probe. Right. It, it's, it was meant to go in, gather data, and send, out, send back telemetry as long as it could. Even places like Denver Airport are, were really constructed, I believe, around this solar flash. So it's in the center of the country, uh, giving everybody equal access and time to get there. And then the trains go down and take them right into the mountains where they're safe from the solar flash. If you go to the Denver Airport, there's these four very disconcerting murals. And one of them has the whole world on fire and all of these extinct animals, like the sea turtle that went extinct a few years ago, and three coffins, a black child, a white child, and a Native American child in a coffin, dead. And what does that mean? You know, what does it mean? And, 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 and you really have to wonder, because the whole Denver airport looks like a Freemasonic temple. There's, sure. there's a plaque and there's this, you know, and you're wondering what is this is really about. And uh, I really think it is about that. I think it's about the sun. Are you aware of there being a base under the Denver airport? Well, yes. Yeah, there's, there's a, a base and a, a tram system that connects to other bases. And did that have something to do with this continuity of government plan? It's a continuity of government, continuity of species. Wow. Okay. And again, when I came out and with about the Denver airport 15 years ago, I was on Nori, and I said that it was part of COG, and everybody, what's COG? You know, what's COG? What's he talking about? Right? And everybody said, there is no such thing as continuity of government. Widener's crazy. And then after 9-11, Cheney came out, and they, why are you moving Bush all around the country? So it was all part of COG. And he said the word cog. I was like, there he is. He's admitted that. There's continuity of government. Zimenga! Zimenga, what do you
I was told to really keep your eye. The, the canary in the coal mine are the volcanoes. Uh, RE told me that when you start seeing these multiple volcanoes starting to uh, erupt, then you know that the, this, uh, uh, it's getting very close to this crustal displacement that occurs and the uh, solar flash. And it all occurs at pretty much the same time. This is a civil defense message for Wednesday, June 6th at 1.30 in the afternoon. The National Weather Service reports slow easterly winds are expected to bring VOG to the island interior starting tonight and over the next two days. Volcanic gas output and ash emissions may increase, affecting air quality across the central and southern half of the island. The trades are expected to pick up again by the weekend. 
Due to the changing wind conditions, the following is provided for your information. Take action to limit further exposure. A community meeting on volcanic ash and bog will be held at 5.30 this evening in Kona at the West Hawaii Civic Center Council Chambers, Building A. You can monitor volcanic gas levels on Hawaii Island by visiting the Civil Defense website or go directly to www.epa.gov Kilauea Air Data. Hawaiian Volcano Observatory reports vigorous lava eruptions continue in the lower east rift. Vacation land is completely covered by lava and a large lays plume is rising from the ocean entry in that area. The Fisher 8 flow has filled Kapoho Bay and is extended 0.7 miles from shore. Due to current volcanic activity, the following policies are in effect. Residents are advised to stay away from all areas of volcanic activity. Government Beach Road between Kahakai Boulevard and Cinder Road is open to Wawa and Papaya Farms Road's residents only with official credentials. There is no curfew. Residents in this area should heed warnings from civil defense officials and be prepared to evacuate with little notice. The Keao Armory Shelter has reached capacity. If you need shelter, the covered court at Pahoa Community Center is open and pet friendly. We are on watch 24 hours a day for your safety. This is your Hawaii County Civil Defense Agency. But what was, what was interesting about the, the meteor is that it was shown to me that because of the energetics, the, um, elec uh, the electrical charge of the earth is changing and it's affecting the way things are attracted to it. So some more debris is being pulled towards the earth. One of them was a uh, meteor that was pulled in over the um, Pacific Ocean, exploded uh, pretty high up in the atmosphere and sent a shock wave and caused a tsunami. Not a super devastating one, but a tsunami. And that just seemed to be some sort of a marker. It was after a lot of this, a lot of, after a lot of this was shown to me in dreams and uh, through technology that I decided to move my family to Colorado yeah, nice. It's one of the safe zones that they showed me. All of these federal agencies needed to prepare for solar flares or geomagnetic disturbance that would bring down not only the electrical infrastructure, but would affect technology long term. So they're building EMP devices to test it in a, probably a city near you at some point. And most people who watch this show are probably savvy enough to know that there was this thing in the 1800s called the Carrington event. At the time, we only had telegraph lines, and it melted everything yeah. just from a solar flare. So this is a very serious concern. What do we do without technology? I mean, do these beings that show up help us once we lose all our toys so that we don't just become totally bereft of, of the basic necessities for life? If we put out a calling, then we'll have beings help us. But during this time period, they fully expect us to... Uh, be untrusting of other beings coming in bearing gifts after we had just broken the control system of another non-terrestrial group. Did that kind of thing happen with Mika's people as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. So they went through a period in which much of their entire technological infrastructure was stripped from them? Yes, and then and everyone was in a bad psychological state. They had to overcome the technical issues and the psychological issues, that's saying a lot. That's a lot to overcome. And they were able to overcome it. How many people watch Suspicious Observer? Yeah. Because they follow the electric universe uh, concept, they've been able to understand how these magnetic connections between the sun and the earth work. And they've been able to start to predict earthquakes. So we're, we're, they're beginning to, to see the transition, I mean, I mean the uh, relationship between the sun and you know, the Earth's weather, the vol volcanism. And the more that we're starting to adopt the um, electric universe model, the, um, the, more that, the more we're gonna be able to understand how the cosmic web works. Um, very recently, they announced the cosmic web and how it works in mainstream media. I mean, how many people have seen that announcement? Um, 
they announced that, oh, we discovered that there is no dark matter. You know, it, uh, it, it's not dark matter. What, what's occurring and what explains um, the anomalies that they're seeing is that everything in space and time is connected. Every galaxy has an electromagnetic filament connecting them. And then the Hubble looked at, uh, uh, they were able to see what the universe looked, you know, like four billion years ago. And uh, with the imagery they pulled up, it looked like a big cobweb with all of the galaxies having uh, kind of a light filament in between them. And what they began to realize is that this, um, these electromagnetic filaments were also bidirectional pathways. That is how the, the cosmic web is how the portal systems work. Each galaxy is connected through these filaments. Each star is connected through these electromagnetic filaments. Within each star, you have planets or, or any type of matter within that solar system. As it rotates around the star, there is an electromagnetic filament connection. Each planet or each planetoid has a grid system on it. And that grid, as the Earth spins, these electromagnetic filaments are connecting to the Earth, but as the Earth spins, it's connecting to different areas. It takes the path of least resistance, just like electricity. So all of these uh, uh, various, uh, I guess, uh, spots where you, where you, where you find uh, a lot of, uh, they call them nodes. I'm trying to remember what, uh, the ley lines. The ley lines are, are this grid, uh, are, are, uh, and they call them nodes, just like you do in, uh, with electricity. As they spin, the connections are made to these nodes, and they're in sacred places. It, and these portals can open up underground, on the surface, and in our atmosphere, our outer atmosphere. And they finally were given a, a hyperdimensional mathematics to be able to calculate when these portals would open and where. And that's that information when it was shared with a lot of the uh, uh, indigenous groups that uh, have been around for a while. They incorporated it into um, the star, you know, where they follow star charts and uh, the calendars. It, it, it had to do with tracking the, um, the various cataclysmic cycles, as well as being able to predict when and where these portals were going to open. Corey, does this solar flash appear to be a basic part of celestial mechanics, regardless of what solar system you're in? Yes. The, and it's, um, it has to do with not only where our star is traveling through the galaxy, but our star's connection through the cosmic web to other stars. There can be feedback of energy through this cosmic web, through our star, which emanates. To what degree do they have access to technology compared to where we are now? How much has that changed for them? It, that changed almost overnight, because like what's expected to occur here, all of the technology they had was basically made inoperable during these solar pulses that occurred. And they had to start over again. And they, when they started over again, their technology started to become more of a consciousness-based technology, hmm. much more advanced. And you're saying that's also expected to happen here? Yes. Yes, once all of this technology that we think is modern is removed, we have uh, these different secret space programs that have built out a infrastructure that, you know, what's going to happen to this infrastructure during this solar pulse? So we're going to go from using electronics only to using different types of technology that is consciousness-based. And Car East people are doing that, I've, you know, with the, they use crystals and different types of stones that somehow they're able to interface with and with their consciousness affect change on a, another object or being. 
there was a whistleblower associated with uh, the original disclosure project where he was tasked with remote viewing and the job of, of his group was to create a communication system that was telepathic because there was an anticipation of a great solar event that would make electrical equipment inoperable. So my point being that we've had other insiders come forward who are also anticipating here that this is going to happen. The vast majority of the population who had been asleep and not doing the work had a very rough time. They, once they found out uh, about the 22 genetic programs, they, and, and they were told that they were being handed over the right to control their own genetics, they rebelled. They stated, or they pretty much rebelled. They began to mix all of their genetics together. You know, all races began to mix together. They began to uh, hack their genetics, giving themselves like green eyes or purple hair, whatever, you know. And um, they didn't understand until generations later, as it, this is like generations going on, um, that the, the, the first genetic farmers that came in had genetically tinkered with them to a point where if they started to mix their, fully mix their DNA and hack certain parts of their DNA, that these uh, horrible genetic diseases would occur. And even though we've been given all of this new technology from the surviving space program and these ETs, we don't understand um, what's going on. And eventually we have to, we reject the ETs. We don't want, we're very, not us, but the, the portion of humanity that doesn't do well during the transition, they're very distrusting of ETs for a number of generations. And eventually when they have this genetic disease, they have to call in the ETs for help. And then the ETs come in and assist them. And then they begin to open up to the ETs and their consciousness begins to catch up to the rest. And after a number of generations, the consciousness gets to a point to where <clears throat> everyone is pretty much caught up. Even a television with a, a long plug going to the wall can absorb enough EMP incidents, EMP radiation to fry the television. Now, if you know the war is coming, you ought to unplug and make sure you unplug all of your critical equipment from the grid, coil up the, the, um, the plug so that it's in a tight circle and not laying out long, then it won't absorb that radiation. Any of your spare electronics should be stored in those, tr those trash cans. And because anything that you currently have hooked up to the grid, if you don't have any warning about EMP, if it arrives without warning, you're, it, basically everything you have connected to the grid is gonna be destroyed. So there you go, folks. This is the real deal. And it was Benjamin Franklin who said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Don't let it happen. Be prepared. Be ready. The smart pad information basically, you know, connects to some ET databases, but mainly connects to all of the uh, dark uh, military scientific databases. And... Uh, like I said, the scuttlebutt in the programs was that uh, uh, this was going to happen at the end of the solar minimum, which uh, could be next year or the year after. What, is the, what are the most likely time windows of when we would expect this solar flash to happen here? Because it obviously is going to happen. Yes, yeah, so it's going to happen. When I was in the programs, they had a window of between 2018 and 2023 and most recently, I heard that they had stretched it to 2024. Meaning that that's not when it's going to happen, but that's window. the last of when it could happen. That's the window they expect it. 2018 to 2024. Right. What we're talking about right now, this great solar flash, this is really the core of everything. If, if this event is really going to happen, mm -hmm. what could possibly be more important for us to be talking about? Absolutely. It or to prepare for there's a lot I've been doing behind the scenes to help humanity, and right now is a very crucial point for everybody. And so anyone that can help me donate something, only if you can afford it, send me an email, donate to my Patreon. Any questions you have, I'll answer them. I really want to help out my community, and I can't do this alone, and I can't do it with no funding, you know. 
I don't even have any way to put food in the table right now. So anyone that can help me out so I can keep making videos, it'll be greatly appreciated. God bless you, everyone.